thank you, Mike. Um, it's nice to get such an introduction from somebody I admire so much. Um, I have great respect and admiration for what the Duke Global Health Institute has done. Now, starting from scratch a small number of years ago, it's become a world-class enterprise and affecting the world in many beneficial ways. So I'm affiliated member of the faculty. I you didn't mention that, but I'm very proud of that. I didn't of mention that. that. Kelly's an affiliate. I <laughs> I'm very proud of that. Uh, you know, you mentioned something else, this 2006 thing from Time Magazine. When I got the call about that, I thought first it was my college buddies playing a joke on me. <laughs> you know, they would think, I bet we can convince him he's really on that list. And then, uh, but then I found out it was true when I got home, and I was very proud of this, and my daughter Christy said, well, Dad, you're not even the most influential person in our house. <laughs> So kids, kids can do that for you. Um, so I'm going to talk about food, but first I'd like to tell you how I got to the place I am today. As Mike mentioned, I, um, I was the founder of a center at Yale University that I ran for a number of years called the Rudd Center. <coughs> Excuse me, we focused mainly on obesity, but I had a, a really transformative experience there that had to do with my teaching. I taught a course at Yale that went back, well, probably more than 12, 13 years now, uh, called the Psychology, Biology, and Politics of Food. And if there was ever an example of a professor learning from teaching, it was this. Uh, because I went into this course thinking that I would teach about obesity and food policy from that perspective. And boy, did I learn a lot, uh, thinking about world trade policy, agriculture subsidies, a broad range of food issues that go beyond obesity. And it led me to the place where I am now, which is to think about food systems broadly and how different areas of food policy might intersect with one another. So for many years, there were two parallel things occurring that didn't connect with each other. There were lots of studies on the impact of nutrition on health and lots of controversies about these and ways to dissect them. But at the same time, there was lots of work in the world of agriculture mainly devised to produce increases in yields so we could produce more crops per acre to help feed a hungry world. But these two areas didn't really connect in any meaningful way, which led to some pretty bad problems. And now more and more people are thinking about food systems, not just food as nutrients, and not just food as its impact on health with a particular health thing in mind if you're particularly focused, but more about the impact of food systems. What are those systems that produce the food we eat? What influences them and what do they influence? And so certainly those food systems influence health, but they also have a big impact on environment, which in turn influences health. But the causal arrows go in lots of interesting directions. So the environment in turn influences the food systems, which influence health. So these reciprocal relationships are really important to know about. Now by my count, and you could chunk this up in lots of different ways, there are four major categories of world food issues. Each one sufficiently threatening to worry about. But when you put them all together, you get really pretty alarming pictures. So these converge on food policy, which is going to be in the middle there. So as you can imagine, hunger and food insecurity is one, obesity is another. The impact of agriculture on the environment and the reverse, and then the third are food safety and security issues, the fourth rather. And then these converge on whatever the policy picture happens to be. And I'm going to try to make the point that world food <coughs> policy is uncoordinated, inconsistent, and as a result, chaotic. And there are a number of negative consequences from this. So I'm hoping to end by saying that there could be great utility in bringing together people who know about these areas individually into a coherent unit to look at world food policy in a unitary way. But first, let me quickly go through each of these four areas and give you just a thumbnail sketch of why I think they're important, not only to human health, but to lots of other aspects of our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, hunger is uh, an issue around the world. Today it doesn't need to be an issue because we produce enough food to feed the world. Now that won't necessarily be the case too much longer, but it certainly is today. And there are a number of different ways you can look at this, but you can look at food stamp recipients in the U.S. and what's happened to utilization of this benefit over the years. 
as the economy gets worse, food stamp utilization goes up. But certainly many, many people are touched by a program like this. By the Women, Infants, and Children program, the WIC program, a large percentage of U.S. kids are touched by this. If you look at the data worldwide, 800 million people are chronically undernourished. Now, if you add to the people who are temporarily undernourished, enough to affect human development and youth and things like that, how the numbers are even much higher. If you look at the leading causes of death in children under five, it divides this way, and that middle circle you see in the white indicates that 54% of children's deaths worldwide, well in developing countries, under age five are attributable to malnutrition. The rates of this vary from parts of the world, from one part of the world to another, but the numbers are high enough to be concerned in almost every country, including the United States. Lots and lots of reasons for this, poverty being the primary one, but there are lots of political issues that help drive this truth, this as well. So refugees become a big problem, and world food aid to refugee populations becomes a real humanitarian challenge. And then what happens to women who are pregnant uh, during periods of having to be refugees, and what happens to their offspring uh, become really very interesting issues. And so one question is whether these food crises are, are the new normal, whether this is just inevitable for the world and what we're going to do about them as we go forward. Now, a lot of work has been done on trying to deal with hunger. Um, a Food and Agriculture Organization report 2011 talked about food-based approaches to help deal with hunger. Fortification of foods, dietary diversification, dietary modification, and biofortification, and these all include genetically modified foods in a very big way, which brings another set of controversies that I won't get into. But there are ways that we can improve our technology in order to help feed the world and improve on micronutrient deficiencies in particular. So golden rice is one, one example of this, a genetically modified version of rice to up the amount of vitamin A in this. This has been shown to increase vitamin A intake in the populations where this particular rice is used. But the impact of this on the environment and other circumstances is not very well known. But the most alarming numbers of all are what you see here, the expected time for the population to double in different parts of the world. So in 50 years, the world population overall is expected to double. Um, but in some of the poorer countries, it's expected to happen even more quickly than that. So it's a real question about whether we can continue to produce enough food to feed these people, uh, to, to feed the world's population, not just the new people who are entering the world in these countries. And if you look at projections about crop yields, most of the increases come about because of technology, uh, genetically modified foods, heavy use of industrial farming and the like. And those have been successful in many ways, but have brought environmental consequences that people worry about. But the projections of our ability to increase crop yields, given the amount of land where crops can be grown, is not very, doesn't present a very optimistic picture given the rapid rise in the, the population that's expected in a relatively short period of time. <coughs> so, hunger is a big issue. Let's turn to obesity. Now, everybody knows about the high rates of obesity in the U.S., but other countries as well. I'll just quickly show you some numbers on this. These are maps, many of you have probably seen these, from the Centers for Disease Control, beginning with 1985. And I'm going to go from there up until 2010. And without worrying too much about the units and measurement and things like that, as the states change colors, it indicates increasing levels of obesity. Now, if you think about the spread of diseases and how quickly they occur, you don't see many diseases other than, say, rapidly, you know, new, newly introduced communicable diseases increasing in the way you're going to see obesity increasing. So I'll just go through the years. Again, every change in color represents increasing obesity. Okay, so those, those are really rapid increases all around the country. Every state has been affected. And so now the rates of obesity in the U.S. are very high. Um, but it's not just in the U.S. 
if you look at the, the increasing rates around the world, those numbers are pretty frightening too, and I'll show you some of those in a moment. Now, lots of reasons are contributing to this. Economic changes, changes in the way people deploy their time in the workforce, family changes, lots of things have gone on. But one of the things that's happened are these profound changes in food norms. So if, if I rewind the videotape to when I was a child or when I was a young boy and think about what food norms look like now, everything has changed. Everything. Where you eat. When I was a boy, you did not eat in your car. <laughs> you did not have a drive-in window to allow you to eat in your car. Now if a car manufacturer doesn't have large enough cup holders, they lose market share when one eats. It was pretty rigid when I was a kid. You know, three meals a day, maybe a snack, and that was really about it. That is completely gone. <clears throat> Some of you, well, you may remember 20, 25 years ago, one of the fast food restaurants introduced breakfast for this, breakfast at fast, for fast food restaurants. I forget which one it was, but people thought they were crazy, that they would go out of business because Americans would be so insulted with the idea of having fast food for breakfast that they would run those, those people out of town. And look what we have now. And now you may have heard of the campaigns, and all of you who were younger have been targeted by these, by the fast food restaurants to get you to eat fast food after midnight. Taco Bell calls it the fourth meal. <laughs> so when we eat has changed. Where we eat. Who we're with when we eat, whether we're working when we eat, all of these things have really changed in profound ways and one can point directly to the food industry because they have done things to systematically change this. And one of the things that's changed have been portion sizes. So these are drinks, but you know, the, the, what's now the small fries of McDonald's used to be the large. A muffin used to be the size of a, a baseball or smaller, and now it can be multiples of that. And it just goes through all the parts of the food supply. So these things from the 7-Eleven, if you buy that 64-ounce double gulp, you're going to be getting 48 teaspoons of sugar. So we've been recalibrated to what a small, medium, and large is. So a gulp, a big gulp, double gulp, whatever, where can it go next? I think this is where it's going next. <laughs> so by the Alan, same gulp. So by the way, this is my son Kevin, who was a good sport posing for this thing. <laughs> Here he is again. <coughs> so this was back in Connecticut, and I, I said, Kevin, I want you to come to the 7-Eleven with me. We're going to take a picture. So you can imagine how excited he was about this. And then we get to the 7-Eleven, and, and he looks inside, and there are some girls he knows. So we had to wait in the car for about 20 seconds until the girls cleared out, and then he was a good sport. Let me take this picture. Let's look worldwide. Projected increases in diabetes in the U.S., China, and India. And almost all of this is driven by uh, nutritional excess. U.S., a big expected increase in diabetes. We have a high base rate already, but in China and India, we're expecting this. So this is an, it will be an enormous strain on the healthcare systems. It is preventable, uh, but it is moving in an inexorable way right now. And of course, many of you have heard of the dual burden, the coexistence of hunger and obesity that occur in the same country, in the same state, in the same city, and within the same family in some cases. And it's not terribly well known that early malnutrition puts individuals at risk for obesity and diabetes later in life, probably because of metabolic imprinting that goes on. Hunger is a big problem, obesity is a big problem, and they're not occurring in different parts of the world. Moving on to the third area, the environmental impact of agriculture, there are a lot of reasons subsumed under this, this banner. And I'm going to talk about just a few. One key issue is antibiotic resistance. Now, I'm not going to talk about that because a member <coughs> of, of your faculty and ours, Anthony So, has done a tremendous amount of good work on this, and I assume has come and spoken about it, so I don't want to repeat what he's done. But I would like to talk about water depletion and climate change as examples. Okay, first, water. 
water uncertainty around the world is a very big issue, and you see report after report on this. One estimate is by 2030, and that's just around the corner, half the world's populations will be living in conditions of high water stress. Well, what do we use water for? Well, there are different estimates on this, but one that we saw recently was this from a 2012 paper that fully 92% of the world's water gets used for agriculture. Now, I've seen other estimates, but I've never seen anything lower than about two-thirds of the world's water being used for agriculture. So it's somewhere in that territory. And a lot of, how, a good bit of how water gets used for agriculture depends on what the water is being used to produce. So the food choices that we make and the food policies around the world are making a big difference in terms of the water use. If you look at trends in water use over time, uh, and we look at um, different parts of the water supply, we look at the way industry is using water and what the trends look like, increases there certainly because of the world population increasing. Domestic use is increasing, again, tracking population change, but the agriculture numbers are really very high, as indicated in the previous slide. So I mentioned that how much water gets used depends on what sort of food is being produced. So here's an example. This graph is going to show you how many gallons of irrigated water it takes to produce one kilogram, 2.2 pounds, of different kinds of food. So first, we'll look at corn. So if you produce corn, it takes 172 gallons to produce 2.2 pounds of corn. Peas comes next. I mean, this is just examples, 529. We can look at pork at 1587, and you can probably guess what's coming on the last one. Who knows what that is? Yeah. Yeah. It's beef. So per kilogram of, of beef, the water required to produce this goes up. Now a lot, and I'll mention this again later, a lot depends on how the, the cattle are raised. And there are, there's industrial farming and there are alternatives to industrial farming that change this equation a good bit. Uh, if, now one of the concerns around the world is increasing meat consumption. And this is a meat production graph looking at um, um, the amount of meat being produced around the world and projected through 2016. And you can see for poultry, pork, and beef, the numbers are all going up. Now, again, there are lots of reasons for this. One is that industrial farming, factory farms, where large, amount of, large numbers of animals are in, raised in a confined space, heavy use of antibiotics and hormones and other things like that used to raise them, allows us to produce more of these things, and the world wants more of these things. The burgeoning size of the middle classes in the developing countries China and India in particular are contributing to this because as people become middle class, they want middle class things, and part of middle class things is meat. <coughs> and you can see the graph here for meat consumption in China and the U.S., and you can see the U.S. is, is been steadily rising, but nothing like the rapid increase in China. So the, the beef and pork and, and other meat consumption has lots of environmental concerns, but water is one of them. And if the use, if, if the heavy consumption of meat is going up, and this is driving uh, inefficient use of water, then this will facilitate water depletion around the world. And one can really ask, how long is it before we start having political unrest around the issue of water? Some of this has occurred already. But what happens when a downriver country no longer has a river? because the upriver country is exploiting all of it for various purposes, but mainly for agriculture. A lake, other shared water resources can make a big difference. So water is just one of the reasons to be concerned about the impact of agriculture, but there are a variety of other ones. Let's take climate change as an example. Uh, so this, this picture, for example, would, be, uh, would portray a factory farm or industrialized farm. This one in California, and as I recall, they could have 100,000 head of cattle on this one farm. But you can see how, how they're confined. You can see how close together they are. Um, so this is an efficient way to produce meat, but whether we can live with the environmental consequences of this becomes a real, real issue. 
So the production of mead in such large numbers has an impact on the environment in a lot of different ways, and here are some of them. So there are the, the inputs, petroleum-based inputs primarily, that have environmental consequences. So in order to feed the cattle, the fertilizers, the pesticides, the hormones given to the cows, etc., and the machinery to transport them, all these sort of things, contributes to climate change. But there are also emissions from the cattle themselves that contribute to climate change a lot. Now, you probably didn't come today expecting to see the inside of a cow, but here it is. So the cows, because of their digestive process, are producing gases from both ends. And because there are so many cattle being raised around the world, and this is true also for other forms of meat, but, but the beef is the most significant example, it's been studied the most, are creating a real contribution to climate change. Now again, part of this depends on how the animals are raised. And so if they're raised in confined circumstances, if they're eating things that they weren't meant to eat, which is a lot of the grains they're fed, the amount of emissions that come from those cows goes up a lot. And so the type of, the ways that these animals are raised really matters. There was this amazing report published by the Food and Agriculture Organization called Livestock's Long Shadow. And what they did was looked at the impact of global war impact on global warming of agriculture of meat in particular. And so they said if we you now most people think global warming is created by carbon dioxide and emissions from cars and trucks and buses and power plants and things like that. Well it certainly is, no question. But they said if you calculate, um, if you set this number of carbon dioxide impact as one, that methane and nitrous oxide have many multiples of that in terms of their effect on climate change. Most, most because they have a very long half-life when they get up into the atmosphere. They take a very long time to break down. So they calculate the FAO that greenhouse emissions from ag animal agriculture exceeds that from all forms of transportation added together. So it's a real player here. And they also say this, that if we look at total global emissions for carbon dioxide, 9% comes from agriculture, just animal agriculture, but for methane it's this and for nitrous oxide it's this. So the climate's being very heavily influenced by food choices people make and by what's happening in agriculture. And the climate change then, in turn, affects the agriculture. And the agriculture, because it's affected climate change, puts you in this reciprocal relationship that takes you to interesting places. And here is one of the most startling examples of this. I'm going to show you a chart put together by the United Nations that shows where wheat grows now in North America and where it's expected to grow, I think, by 2050 or 60. And it looks like this. So what's in yellow is where wheat grows in North America now. All the way from Texas, way up into a northern, a, a band, a little bit <coughs> in southern Canada. But by 2050, the only wheat that's expected to grow in the U.S. will be in northern Minnesota and North Dakota. It will all get pushed up into Canada. Now this is just one crop. What about corn? What about soybeans? What about apples? What about cabbages? What about all these other things? Now some crops are more temperature sensitive than others, and it could be that wheat is the most temperature sensitive. I don't know whether that's true or not, but certainly this is a pretty alarming figure given that we're only talking about 2050. And what will this do around the world for migration of populations? Will this lead to refugees? Um, what will this mean for the production of certain crops in certain parts of the world? Uh, will wealthier worlds start buying up parts of the developing world where, um, where food doesn't grow very well now but might because of climate change? Um, it's really very interesting to think about how this might go. So you have this relationship between agriculture and the environment that's really interesting. And um, if you get this, this spiraling out of control, and some people think we're there already, then we've got real problems on our hands. Uh, and this was made pretty clear in a report issued just this year by the United Nations uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And these reports are extremely interesting to read. Um, now there are some places where we've made improvement, other places where we haven't, but food <coughs> and agriculture come through with time and time again in this report. 
as a major part of the impact on, or, the, or the view on climate change. And this report uh, <coughs> includes the following. All aspects of food security are potentially affected by climate change. So this is a really pretty dire set of circumstances. So we've talked about hunger, about obesity, and about the environment. Now, within that entire <coughs> thing, we haven't talked about the safety of genetically modified foods. We haven't talked about shrinking biodiversity. I passed over the antibiotic resistance. There are about a dozen other things we could have talked about. I just chose a few to be exemplars. But let's move on to the fourth area, food safety and security. Now, when I was young, uh, there was very little worry about food safety issues. People got food poisoning once in a while, but it wasn't much of a problem. But the outbreaks of foodborne illnesses really weren't, weren't talked about very much, and I don't think happened very often. And America was very well known for food safety, for the quality of their food safety um, inspections and regulations and things like that. So we had a quite a food safe, uh, quite a safe food supply, but now it's becoming harder to do that. And you see these kind of things, you see these kind of things, uh, you see um, lots of academic papers on this, and the concerns aren't just in the U.S., but they are occurring all around the world, and there's a special interest in China in food being imported from China. Uh, because of concerns about the food safety and qualities there. So these foodborne illnesses are becoming harder to control, we think primarily because of industrial agriculture, that the runoff from these factory farms are causing contaminations into the air and water supply. Uh, this is leading to lots of different problems, uh, including the antibiotic resistance. But this is a big problem, and so um, people living now have to worry about this more than people used to. Now, it's still not to the point where you go to a farmer's market or you go to the store and you worry about the lettuce you're buying or you worry about the carrots or the cantaloupes or the meat. But you're also not surprised when you hear about outbreaks of these foodborne illnesses. You just hope that it doesn't happen to hit you. But how long are we going to be able to control these? It becomes a really interesting issue. And then you add to that the possibility of bioterrorism through the food supply. This food safety and security part of the four part uh, grouping that I had is really very important. <clears throat> and this quote from the, the WHO about foodborne illnesses around the world gives you a sense of the extent of it and the fact that people are thinking about these. So what I've tried to do so far is paint a picture of how many uh, problems there are out there with the food supply. So there are lots of people worried about hunger. Uh, there are big NGOs, there are uh, huge government organizations like USAID paying attention to this issue. Lots of people around the world are thinking about obesity. Other people are thinking about agriculture and the environment. Others, food safety and security. But the problem is that they're uncoordinated and unattached to one another. And because of this uncoordination, this lack of coordination, you get strange food policies, and I'll give you some examples of this. So one of the questions is, who's watching the store? Is there anybody anywhere who's looking out after all these things at the same time in order to create good food policy? Well, let's look at some of the potential players, and let's see where they stand on this. So again, we're back to the four areas of food concern. Well, let's look at a group like the Centers for Disease Control. They certainly pay a lot of attention to nutrition and health. So they deal with hunger, food insecurity. They also deal with obesity in a big way, in a very productive way. But they're not paying attention to these other two areas. So they don't cover everything. Let's look at the US Department of Agriculture. Well, they would be the natural example here. And they kind of deal with everything, but they deal with food insecurity and food safety in a big way, and much less with environmental agriculture and obesity. You know, they, they do work in these areas, but I have those circles smaller uh, than the other ones just because they don't deal with them to the same extent they do with the others. Um, let's look at USAID. They pay a lot of attention to food-related issues. Well, they pay attention to these three, but hunger and food insecurity more strongly than the others, so they don't really pay attention to the obesity uh, area much. WHO pays attention to these two, but not all four. 
So you get the picture here, but let's look at a few more examples. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, they would be the natural example. They, they do these three things in kind of a big way, but they're not a policy-making organization, but they're not really dealing with obesity very much. There are NGOs like this group, IFPRI they're called. They do some terrific work, but they're not paying attention to all of it. So there's not, there aren't private organizations or NGOs doing this. What about foundations? Well, the Rockefeller Foundation and Gates are, are into food in a big way, but they're mainly paying attention to these things and not, not to the obesity issue or food safety and security. So the problem, as I said, are food policies where you might get wins in one area and losses in another. And so we're not having good food policy around the world. So there are lots of examples of conflicts, and I'll just give you a few here. So one, if you're looking at uh, international development, the growth of the food industry in developing countries becomes a pretty important priority. Now what does that mean? Well, it means agribusiness. It means crop yields improving. It means genetically modified foods and pesticides and fertilizers and exploitation of the groundwater and all these sort of things. But it also means McDonald's, Coca-Cola, KFC, and all the other multinational companies. So certainly there are conflicts between the growth of the food industry and public health. Now, the growth of the food industry might help solve the hunger problem, but certainly isn't helping with obesity and some of the other chronic diseases. Uh, many of you have probably heard of the Green Revolution. Uh, this started in the 1950s, funded primarily by the Rockefeller Foundation as an um, effort to try to feed the world, feed and clothe the world. And they hired a, a very um, inspirational, uh, Rockefeller Foundation did, hired a very inspirational agriculture specialist named Norman Borlaug, who later won the Nobel Prize for discoveries. And they went country after country trying to increase, increase yields of wheat, of corn, of rice, of cotton, and a lot of other things. And were, were greatly successful in some ways. But there were environmental consequences nobody knew about in those early days. But then finally people did discover, but got ignored in this push to feed the world and increase crop yields around the world. So there are conflicts here. There's a very interesting domestic debate that I've been involved in to some extent, which is whether food stamp or SNAP recipients should be permitted to use their benefits to buy sugared beverages. <coughs> now, 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 just before I explain the two sides of the debate, um, how many of you would vote for a law that said that food stamps should not be permitted to buy sugar beverages, soda and things? Okay, and how many of you would vote against that? Okay, so more in favor than against. Well, here's the, the, the debate. So the government now buys just about $4 billion worth of soda a year from the food stamp program. Now, if you didn't have a food stamp program, who in the world would vote for something like that? Because then government has to pay for the obesity and diabetes that follows from the high soda consumption. So why in the world would you put in a benefit that's making people sick? So the public health community generally feels that food stamp um, policy should be changed so that people can buy, you don't want to cut back the benefit overall, but you want to change around what you can what you can buy with it so that people would buy healthier foods. The hunger community says, is, is really very opposed to this, and says that people are already stigmatized who are food stamps recipients, and taking away a benefit that they're used to receiving is a real problem, and people in these uh, dire economic circumstances have a lot more to worry about than just drinking soda. So why would you change the benefit? Now, without coherent policy where the parties are talking to one another, what you get is all-out war, and you get paralysis as a consequence. A lot of you know about the corn to ethanol supports program, where the government put a lot of money into turning corn in, into ethanol, basically for environmental reasons. Well, I'm not an environmental specialist, but my colleagues who are say that there are doubts about whether it succeeded on that front. But what it did was it pushed up world prices of corn in a very abrupt way. And it led to spikes in prices around the world, food riots in developing countries, 
um, migration of populations into the, the urban areas that was occurring anyway. And so here was a policy made by a group of people with one issue in mind, but not paying attention to what the consequences would be. And then this issue of development and nutrition becomes really very important as um, the U.S. and other countries are putting money into the developing world, what is the money being used for? How much of it should be used for food and what should we be doing in those countries? There is some thought that as the economies improve in different countries, nutrition will improve with it. But there was a recent um, report suggesting that this doesn't necessarily occur. That is, these economies boom, children who are malnourished don't necessarily get fed any better. So there are political issues involved with this as well. And this came from this um, paper in The Lancet that talked about the association between economic growth and childhood undernutrition. So the problem that I see here is that there are these major areas of world food concern. Each area has its own um, advocates, its own researchers its own NGOs, its own government agencies, but they don't talk. And as a result, you get food policy that's not working very well, as I suggested. So can anything be done about this? Well, I think there could be, and I think there could be something at Duke that might actually help address this. So what I've been thinking about is the idea of a World Food Institute. Creating an institute where you do have experts and advocates, and people come together who pay attention to all these areas. So from this, you could create coherent and coordinated world food policy. So does corn, the subsidies to the farmers to turn corn into ethanol make sense? Well, let's bring people together who realize what all the consequences might be so they could talk to one another. Does it make sense to restrict food stamp benefits? And these are just domestic issues. But how should money be put into developing countries in order to develop food capacities there? Should there be restrictions on multinational food companies colonizing these countries around the world in an attempt to change their food norms just like us? So if you want to know what food norms are going to be in Ethiopia and China and India and Somalia, it's coming to a theater near you. All they need to do is look at us to see what's going to happen. It's just down the road. But what the food companies can show tremendous growth now by taking their products into new markets, emerging markets is the euphemism for this. But once they saturate those markets and they're selling as much KFC and pizzas and hamburgers and sugar beverages as they can into these markets, the only way to improve growth beyond that is to get the existing people to eat more. How do you get them to eat more? You systematically increase portion sizes. You teach people you can eat in your car. You show that fast food is okay for breakfast and after midnight. You do everything in these countries that's being done very systematically here. So how long is it going to be till the rest of the world has the same food norms like us? There are lots of signs that most of these countries are well on their way. So, in my mind, a World Food Institute could be a pretty cool thing, and it could be an interesting thing to have at a place like you. So what you'd want to do in this, potentially, would be to cover the four areas with expertise in a variety of disciplines. And I don't know many places where people from these different areas come together and work on food policy. And, of course, you'd want to involve stakeholders in interesting ways. And one of the key issues here would be the food industry. How would they be involved? Because my guess is that if we wanted to fund a World Food, food Institute, um, the, the food industry might be there eager to help fund that kind of thing. But would that make sense to get money from the industry to fund an, an institute like that? So my sense is that it, Duke might be a pretty interesting place to do something like this. Why? Because we have a lot of expertise here already. We have a world-class world -class Global Health Institute. We have lots of people around campus who pay attention to international development. We have a very, so we have a, a great medical school. There are lots of other resources here at the university, including people scattered about who care a lot about food issues. But you add to that a very good school of public health at Carolina, a good school of agriculture at NC State, 
You have people in the triangle, the Research Triangle Park, who work with USAID. There's just a lot of talent in this area, and this could be a very rich area for building something like this. So whether we can ever pull this off will depend on donors and vision and whether people can pull together as teams, but I see a real striking need for this. And I think if, if we don't start doing this, these food problems are going to continue to rage out of control. Uh, water will be depleted, the climate will be changed irreparably by agriculture as a primary contributor. Uh, people will continue to be concerned about confinement of animals and industrial agriculture. There are so many reasons to worry about this. That, and, and lots of people do worry about these. My guess is if I went around and talked to each of you, there would be lots of reasons that you care about food. Some for your personal health, some because you care about animal welfare, others would care about the environment. There are just a lot of different reasons, but it's not all coming together. And I think if it did, it could be pretty impressive. So that's why we may try to work on this idea of a World Food Institute. So why don't I stop there and I'll be happy to answer any questions people have. But I thank you for coming. I, you know, the packed room here, I assume is a sign that people care a lot about these food policy issues, which is a very good sign. This course that I mentioned that I taught at Yale would have about 400 students each year. Um, and it was a sign that young people care a lot about these issues. And that gives me great hope for the future. But we have to take it seriously. And we have to do something more than just hope this groundswell of interest comes about changing. There leads to change in things. We need to do something more systematically by drawing it all together. OK, so I'll stop there. And if we have time for questions, I'm happy to answer them. The only thing is, could you just say who you are and where you're from so he has a sense of who he's talking to? Hi, my name is Sulzan, and I'm a master's student in global health at Duke Global Health Institute. Um, so my question is um, more from, it comes from a more personal perspective. Coming from India, um, I studied in England and, and now in US, and one of the first things that I noticed was the fact how cheap it is to get fast food and how <coughs> cheap it is to get Coke. Coke is more is cheaper than water, and I was just wondering whether there's any possibility that um, tax benefits for companies which promote nutrition and more taxes on company like high prices instead of banning and saying hey you can't do this is that something which would um, kind of help solve this problem? Any? Yes, it definitely could. You know the, the economists are are. More and more economists are starting to pay attention to these issues. So my colleague Matt Harding from Sanford is a good example. I think that speaks well for our future. And among the things we need to deal with are, are government tax policies and subsidy policies that affect the cost of food. Now, th this is a complicated area, and as I started to look into it, I was told it was so complicated you couldn't begin to understand it, the subsidy policy and what it does to food prices. But at its very basis, let's say you go to a McDonald's and you walk up to the counter and you buy one of their packaged meals. Uncle Sam is there with a wallet open helping you buy that meal because they're helping subsidize the hamburger, they're helping subsidize the french fries because of the low cost of grains that create the cooking oil, and they're subsidizing the cost of that sugared beverage because of high fructose corn syrup. Now, if you go to that same restaurant and you order salad and a bottle of water, Uncle Sam gets disinterested, closes the wall, and walks away. Wrong. That's wrong. So your point is exactly right. Government policy, subsidy policy, and ag policy could line up better with health policy. There's more and more talk about it, but it's pretty slow movement. Um, and the agribusiness companies um, get very threatened when you talk about doing this, and it's hard to blame them. Because when the subsidies came into effect, they created factories that would create high fructose corn syrup. Well, I mean, they can't just walk away from their factories. I mean, their business model is built around this. So this is probably going to be slow going, but it's important that the changes be made. So that, as I said, agriculture and health, policy, health, health policies line up. Too shy an audience. <laughs> Second question, go ahead. Another question. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, from the maps that you showed, and it was very interesting to see that the uh, co the states which had more uh, rate of prevalence of obesity were also states which are 
have maybe you know more like they're not doing as well like the richer states comparatively had and that is something I found very interesting especially when you talked about snaps um, buying soda I if I'm not wrong you can also buy cigarette with snap um, no you can't you can? no but but you're right there's a direct relationship between poverty and obesity so the states with the highest poverty least education and all those other markers would be having the highest rates of obesity <coughs> and they tend to be the, the states that are slowest out of the gate to try to think about policies that would help change things like taxes on things like soda would be an example uh, changing nutrition policies in schools there are some exceptions but for the most part the states that have the lowest rates of the problem albeit still high rates are the ones that are making the most progress so Connecticut and California, for example, were the first states to have really tough nutrition standards for foods in schools. But California and Connecticut aren't those really high-risk states. Bob? I'll be here. No, it's quite a few. Okay, oh, good. Never mind. Yeah, skip to them. I just didn't want awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So my question is kind of following up you on... Are I'm, I'm sorry. My name is Christine Tenekian. I am a dietitian at the Duke Diet and Fitness Center, where we it's a residential obesity treatment center. All of us are from there. Um, and so uh, our, my question is related to what was discussed about the factories. You know, these companies that make high fructose corn syrup, for example, are not going to willingly just say, okay, we won't take the subsidies anymore. Is, do you think that there is an alternative something else that they could be encouraged to do that would be more in a way to promote public health so that it's not just a blow for them because obviously no company is going to want to just take a blow from new policies that would promote public health. Sure. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, sure. If you look at agribusiness, um, you know, the, the, the business of big agriculture, so uh, owning the patents to seeds, uh, owning immense amounts of farmland, basically doing vertical integration, owning all parts of, the, parts of the food supply that go from the seed all the way up to the table. Uh, our agribusinesses do that extremely well, and there might very well be a role for that. But if government policy can encourage that toward the production of healthier foods, then we'd be better off. Now, it becomes pretty complicated to think about exactly what that policy would be. There's a tremendous amount of pushback. So legislators from those farming states uh, tend to, of course, be swayed by the political influence of the big companies and the farmers, and they have realistic concerns. So it's important that we start thinking about what good policy would be, how it can be done in an economically feasible way, get all the stakeholders involved, but start making progress. Good yeah. 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 It's great talk. I'm, I'm Gary Bennett, uh, Psychology and Neuroscience and Global Health Institute. Um, and it, what you do, your last answer may actually be an answer to this question as well, but you know, one of the things I observe in, in our work in, in impoverished communities, um, domestically in particular, is that the fast food locations are usually the first, second, and third jobs for, for urban poor individuals. And, and so I just wonder, in thinking, taking a step back, how do, how do we respond to arguments from the food industry that uh, more regulation and putting additional constraints on their ability to operate domestically and increasingly um, globally um, will have a, a negative impact primarily, at least initially, on the most disadvantaged folks who incidentally have the highest rates of obesity. Yes. So it's a very interesting argument and one that's important to make. Now, in an ideal world, the idea of convenient food that's inexpensive and accessible is not a bad thing. It's just what happens to be sold in those places. So presumably you could turn that around with changes in policy so that there would still be jobs, there would still be the opportunity to, to eat at those places, but they would just be selling healthier foods. Um, you know, and, and you could just think of the price incentives that are out there. If you buy a two liter bottle of Coke, you get a lot better deal per ounce than if you buy a can. But if you buy three heads of lettuce compared to one, the unit price doesn't change. And that would be true for carrots, it would be true for a lot of other things. And so, again, there are policies that really could help affect these things. But jobs would be an important consideration, no question about it. Yes? Hi, I was great. Um, Lord Samberg here, the DHI as a research scholar. Um, my question, kind of thinking back on the initial one there, that I can talk a lot about the environmental impact of these non plant based diets, as I'll call them, which was really compelling. And so, I, you know, other than sort of talking about changes in food policy for subsidies, 
what do you think would also like changes in norms or what else would it take to really change the norm so that plant-based diets would be more compelling or desired right. you know, domestically or well, I mean, first of all, what I don't want to communicate is an anti-meat message necessarily right. because when you talk to the experts and you need to get nutrients into the world's, you know, the bodies of people in the world, protein is an important part of that, and meat can become an important way to supply that protein and some other nutrients as well. But it's how the, how the whether it's industrial agriculture versus uh, more traditional forms of agriculture that go back over the years becomes a real issue. And what are the inputs that get used to create them? You know, with the hormones and pesticides, all that kind of stuff become really important. But with that said, most health experts believe that a shift toward a more plant-based diet would be a good thing for health and the environment at the same time. So how can you do that? Well, you know, the, the, when, when you bring up the word education, the food industry rubs their hands in glee. Um, because you simply can't do enough education to undo what the industry is doing to push in the other direction. Um, and so here's an example. Um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is now by far the largest funder of work on childhood obesity in the world. They're spending about $100 million a year. This was a godsend. But the food industry spends $100 million every year advertising junk food just to kids by January 4th. They've already spent $100 million by January 4th. So there's just no way you can educate your way out of this. And that's why I think structural changes are much more important. Changing what can be served to our kids in schools, what can be marketed on television and other forms of media, the fundamental price of foods with tax and subsidy policy, I think those things will get you to the goal line much more quickly. So education is fine, but it's like it's quicksand. You know, it's a trap that you don't want to get in because you might not get out, um, and it's not going to be very effective, I think. Let's take some over here. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Chloe Holzinger. I am a master's student at the Pratt School of Engineering or Mechanical Engineering, and just commenting on your last comment about education. If you go back to the map of the U.S. with all of the countries um, today that have lower obesity rates, it looks like a lot of those countries are, or, sorry, states um, are places where there is a large prominent university there that does a lot of good work um, and has a very wide influence. So, and I also know, or I read <laughs> that People have been thinking about if Detroit had a big public university there, then maybe it wouldn't have gone bankrupt. So I guess I was just wondering if you had any comments on that sort of thinking. Well, I mean, I can't comment on Detroit in particular, but I, <laughs> the idea that universities can be an important player here is a very good one. And why? Well, it's where our young people are, and the young people are where the creativity and ingenuity is going to come from. Young people care much more about these issues than people who are older. Um, Young people know that their future depends on solving these problems. So I think universities are a very important resource to harness in order to help deal with this. Um, now universities have, you know, but it, universities have interest in these issues, but it's scattered all over the place. An agriculture school here, a psychology department there, a nutrition department here, it's really all over, and it really is gonna take some coordination of efforts. Uh, you know, grants given to the universities for program projects that bring people together would be an example of funding that might help that. So there are a lot of things that could be done. Um, you know, the state of North Carolina, for example, if the state gave money to create a food institute that could bring together people from the universities, it could be very forward-thinking, very influential. So you hope the government gets more and more involved, but that's only going to happen if young people vote which is happening in lower numbers than ever before, which is a real problem, and that they say that food is an important issue. Now, it also takes young people to believe that they have a voice. You know, there's a cynicism that people have about not having an impact in governments, paralyzed, frozen, dysfunctional, all those sort of things. But there are some really good people in government who will listen. And if you elect people who will listen, then it gets even better. So, for example, we worked um, on a very interesting project, I don't have time to talk about now, with the Attorney General in the state of Connecticut. 
And he told me, he said, if we get four or five telephone calls on something that starts to look like a trend, and they start to pay attention, not yeah. necessarily that they'll move on it, but it'll at least get to their attention. And you know, how hard is it to get four or five friends to call a senator or a state attorney general or something? Just get that movement going, it can ultimately make a big difference. So that's a good place to stop. I know many of you have questions, but it's 1 o'clock. Uh, let me thank Kelly, assure him the Global Health Institute would be happy to be part of a World Food Institute. <laughs> and it looks like many of you would like to be, and that's great. And now you see why Kelly has the renowned reputation that he has, and we hope he's successful in building this enterprise that he's described today. Thank you for coming.